uh, good morning, and uh, what a blessing to just be back with you as we continue to study uh, through the book of Isaiah. You can open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Isaiah as we continue our study verse by verse, remembering last week that we had God showing his grace once again as he was um, really bringing a woe, a, a challenge, a, a judgment that was going to come uh, on the nation of Israel. But he ends up saying that the work of my hand is in its midst. They will hollow my name and hollow the Holy One of Jacob and fear God, the God of Israel, eventually that that would take place. I've got a loud buzzing up here. I don't know if Johnny left something on maybe. Um, went away now, Spence, so whatever you did, great. <laughs> I just want to make sure that as we move into this next chapter, chapter 30, that we remember how gracious our God is and what a blessing it is to be able to read even when he's bringing wool, when he's bringing judgment, when he's telling the nation of Israel uh, that they're going to have to pay consequences for their continued rebellion, that the Lord looks forward to the millennial reign and, of course, a time when Israel will come back to bowing at his feet, to be committed to him uh, in that perfect way that he has called for us all uh, to be. <clears throat> and so when we open up chapter 30 and he begins the woe to Egypt, we're reminded that he has had many warnings uh, to the nation. And so look with me at chapter uh, 30 as we look on and the Lord continues to be able to tell Israel, be careful of who you put your trust in. That's a good word for us this morning, isn't it? Be careful of who you put your trust in. Who it is that you look to and who it is that you're going to, if you will, come before when you're in need of help. So he starts out, woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin. And so the Lord comes right to back in chapter 30 to speaking to the children of Israel and the rebellion that they are caught up in. And I think it's worthy to stop for a moment and just to be able to see that if we're not making plans that are aligned with the Lord, then we are in sin. Sometimes we don't think in those terms, but we need to recognize that God has called us to be those born again to align the spirit that is within us with him, to be able to make our plans based on us spending time, if you will, in the counsel of the Lord, seeking from him what it is that he may want. The Bible says this in Proverbs in chapter 16. It says, a man plans his ways, but God directs his steps. It is that you and I need to be planning our ways so that the Lord would direct those steps in such a manner that it would be pleasing to him. They were in sin because they had not sought the Lord. And that's what he's saying. And church, that's a good word for us again this morning. That we would recognize we need to seek the Lord so that the plans that we set are the ones that are the steps that he would direct that we would be guided by him, directed by him, and that the plans that we have made are in line with those steps that the Lord has for us to take. So important for us to be able to figure this out, that they were going on their own to figure out things for themselves. Rather than being those that sought the Lord, they just said, look, we're going to figure this out for ourselves, Lord. We don't need your help. And the Lord is rebuking them for them. But let me just say this. How many times have we been in that same position? A lot of times we love to point the finger at those in, in the Bible that, that are caught up and the Lord is exposing that are involved in sin and say, man, how could you do that? And except that the three fingers are pointing back at us, right? 
And we look in the mirror and we recognize, Lord, I need your grace. I need your mercy poured out on my life. We need to train ourselves to be those that really seek the Lord and his counsel before we make plans so that our steps are in accordance with him. Verse 2, he says, Who walk to go down to Egypt and have not asked my advice to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Therefore, the strength of Pharaoh shall be your shame and trust in the shadow of Egypt shall be your humiliation. For his princes were in zone, and his ambassadors came to Haines. And they were all ashamed of a people who could not benefit them, or be helped or benefit, but a shame and also a reproach. And so Isaiah has another woe for Israel, and this woe is for them depending on Egypt to come to their rescue rather than coming to the Lord. They'd already been warned that Egypt <coughs> was going to be overtaken by the Assyrians. So why would you align yourself with Egypt knowing as the Lord has already given them that warning? Turn to chapter 19 for a moment. Let me remind you of that. God has already given them warning that they were not to turn to Egypt, but rather to turn to him. For Egypt was going to be devastated by the Assyrians as they moved through the land. Isaiah chapter 19 and verse 11 says this, Surely the princes of Zon, that's exactly who we're speaking of, are fools, the word says. Pharaoh's wise counsel gives foolish counsel. How do you say to Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of the of the ancient king. And so the Lord has already given warning to Israel that only foolish advice could come from Egypt. And yet, Israel is so desperate that they are going back to Egypt to try and make an alliance with Egypt that they might come and band together to fight against the Assyrians. God spoken very clearly that the Egyptians and the ten tribes of Israel and the north would be uh, dealt with by the Assyrians and overtaken. And yet Israel is still in their foolishness being given to man for their savior rather than to the Lord. And so Isaiah goes on and he says this, the burden against the beast of the south through the land of trouble and anguish from which came the lioness and the lion, the viper and the fiery servant, serpents, they will carry their riches on backs of young donkeys and their treasures on the humps of camels to a people who shall not profit, for the Egyptians shall help in vain and to no purpose. Therefore I have called her Rahab Hem Shembeth. And so Israel, when wanting to go to Egypt, would have to pass through the Negev Desert. It's a dangerous place where there are all kinds of wild beasts and animals, snakes and different uh, things that they would have to, you know, negotiate with uh, as they traveled through. They would travel usually on donkeys, as the word says that they would, and camels. And they would bring all kinds of different um, gifts to be able to, to give to the Egyptian uh, authority because they were so desperate and knowing that the Assyrians were uh, coming. But Isaiah calls Egypt, look at it with me, Rahab hem Shebeth, which means the do-nothing state. It was actually a phrase that was used to describe hippopotamus because they usually did nothing but sit in the Nile River most of the day. And so this is a crazy name that's given, but it was one that was to be able to say, they're going to be of no good to you. And yet you're continuing to go to them for help. 
Listen in Hebrews in chapter 4 what the Lord says for us. He says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. But we need to be those that are coming to the place of recognizing it's only you, Lord, that I can trust in. It's only you, Lord, that you want me to be able to come to. You want the first cry of every one of our voices to be to you for times of help. And so we need to learn the very first place for us to go in our time of need is to the Lord God Almighty. And not to anyone else, especially not to those that we've already been warned about by the Lord. Again, this phrase that Isaiah is using is simply pointing Ju Judah to be those that turn from the rebellion to God because he was the only one that could help them in their real time of need, not the Egyptians. But look at what he says as he continues about the re these rebellious people. Verse 8, he says, Now go and write it before them on a tablet. And note it on a scroll, that it may be for a time to come, forever and ever, that this rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to seers, do not see, and to prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits. <coughs> Get out of the way, turn aside from the path, listen to this, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. And you want to talk about some scary verses in the Bible. They're here for us in chapter 30. Where Israel has become so rebellious that the Lord says through Isaiah, to Isaiah, look Isaiah, I want you to make sure you write this down on a scroll. I want to make sure, because Judah has become so rebellious, look what it says, the children who will not hear the law of the Lord, and they've had their hearts come to a place of saying, cause the Holy One of Israel to cease coming before us. They become so rebellious, God says, I want you to write it down on a scroll so that they'll never be able to say they were not warned. That they'll always have that scroll before them that is going to say that the Lord gave them warning and they were so given to their life of sin, so stuck in their rebellion that they would not choose God but to continue in their sin. Turn to John with me, please, in John chapter 3. Such a powerful passage of Scripture in John chapter 3. We all run to John 3.16 so often, but would you look at John 3.19 for a moment? Where the Word says this, And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. Church, they did not want the Lord, they did not want his word, they did not want his counsel, they did not want his direction, because they liked their life of sin too much to give it up. It's an incredible thing when we look at this passage of Scripture and the Lord just gives us through Isaiah, hey, I want you to make sure you write it down because I don't want them to ever have a, an opportunity to say that they weren't warned, that I didn't give them opportunity to repent, the chance to be able to say, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner I'm begging for you to forgive me. And I think that's a, another passage of Scripture that we need to be able to come to a place this morning and be able to ask ourselves, are there things, we think about the horrible Jews in Israel at this time and how could they be so rebellious, but when we stand in front of the mirror, we see that same rebellion, don't we? 
And we recognize that there are areas of our life that the Lord has given us warning, the areas of our life that the Lord continues to tell us that I'm giving you opportunity to repent and we continue in it. Rather than being those that bow before him and be able to ask for his forgiveness. Leviticus in chapter 20 and verse 7 says this, Consecrate yourselves before the Lord and be holy. For I am the Lord your God, and you shall keep my statutes and perform them. I am the Lord who sanctifies you. You and I need to be those that walk in a manner that others can look into our lives and say, I want to be just like that. We need to be those that live in a life in such a manner that people are drawn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. It's a call of God for all of us. And we need to be those that are conscious of it. Move on with me back to Isaiah chapter 30, verse 12. He says, therefore, thus says the Holy One of Israel, because you despise this word and trust in the oppression and perversity and rely on them, therefore, this iniquity shall be on you like a breach ready to fall, a bulge in the high wall, whose breaking comes suddenly in an instant. And he shall break it like the breaking of the potter's vessel, which is broken in pieces, and he shall not spare. So there shall not be found among you its fragments, a shard to take a fire from the heap, or to take water from the cistern. For thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning from in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in confidence, you shall be, uh, shall be your strength. But you would not, and you said, no, for we will flee on horses. Therefore, you shall flee, and we will ride on swift horses. Therefore, those who pursue you shall be swift. One hundred shall flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five you shall uh, flee till you are left as a pole on the top of the mountain and as a banner on the hill. Interesting that right after, right after, they told God they did not want him to confront them. Isaiah confronts them. Well, only as the Lord can. We see them saying, I don't want the Lord. I don't want his, his commands. I don't want his co uh, direction. I don't, I don't want the Lord at all. And right away, here it is, Isaiah confronting them as the Lord gives him the words to be able to put them on blast. And he says to them, look, Isaiah says that they would trust in the oppression and perversity or really saying that you're going to rely on Egyptian military when you have God Almighty's might. He says, rather than trusting God, you're going to suffer as 1,000 shall flee at the threat of one. And so it would be exactly as he said, as the Assyrians came in, destroying all that was there. Only the Lord could take the defense up for Egypt, or for Israel. Only the Lord. And we've seen that as we've gone through and, and I've spoken to you from 2 Kings, the blessing of watching the Lord come to their defense and be able to have that one angel taking care of 185,000 <coughs> of the Assyrians. But take note with me, if you would. He says, for thus says the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest, you shall be saved. In quietness and in confidence you shall, or and quiet, quietness and confidence shall be your strength. And recognize with me that God's saying, listen, I will be your victory. I'm the one that will take care of all the opposition. I'm the one that you can call on when your enemy is all around you. And if you will today, recognize that all we have to do is look to the cross. 
And as we bring all of it to the cross, the Lord has done the work that only he can do. The victory is there for all of us that turn to him. And what a blessing it is for us to be able to know that in the quietness, our confidence will be in our time of rest. That is resting in the truth that God's word is exactly what's going to happen. That we can trust in him being able to be our defender. He says he is our refuge and our strength. That when we place our trust there, there's a peace that comes upon us. When we have been bombarded by all the kinds of things from the outside in the world that we live in today, that the one place we can go for peace is to the cross of Christ. Amen. Well, move on with me as we see how gracious our God is. In chapter 30, verse 18, it says, Therefore, the Lord will wait. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being the Lord in rebellion, 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 rebellion? And the word of God says, the Lord will wait. What an incredible, gracious God we serve. Listen to what he says. The Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you, and therefore he will be exalted, that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. For the people shall dwell in Zion and, and Jerusalem, and you shall weep no more. He will be very gracious to you at the sound of your cry. When he hears it, he will answer you. And through the Lord, uh, and though the Lord gives you bread of adversity and water of affliction, yet your teachers will not move into the corner anymore. But your eyes shall see your teachers, and your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Whenever you turn to the right hand, or whenever you turn to the left, you <clears throat> will also defy the covering of the images of silver and the ornaments of your molded images of gold. You will throw them away as an unclean thing, and you will say to them, get away. What a gracious God we serve. We serve, the Lord says very clearly, therefore the Lord will wait that he will be gracious to you. And just like for many of us, the Lord waited, even though he allowed the bread of adversity and the water of affliction to come into our life, that it was only there for one reason. And that was that we might repent and that we might come back to him. So it will be with Israel as we watch in those later days in the millennium reign. It was for the reason, the, the difficult times, the trials that the Lord allowed to come into our life, that we might be broken to the place <clears throat> that we might realize who we are, a sinner in need of a savior, ask forgiveness, and then look to the Lord to be the Messiah that he is. One day, all of Israel as a nation will do that very thing. Let me remind you of 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. One of my favorite verses in the passage or in the Bible, it says, The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he's long-suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord allows this time for us to be able to come to our senses. He, he allows difficulties to come into our lives that we might be able to be broken down to the point of crying out to him, calling out to him, and then being restored by him. These people have just said, God, we don't want you. And the Lord says, I know that you don't want me, but I'm going to wait because your ancestries, our ancestors will one day want me. And of course, he is speaking of the fulfillment in the future, the far fulfillment as we have talked about in the millennial reign, the thousand year reign of the Lord. But you want to know how gracious our God is, church, really. 
we look at this passage of scripture and we recognize that it is going to be in that millennial reign, but we don't have to wait for the millennial reign to see the grace of God. Yeah. All you have to do is turn around and look around and look up here and you'll see the grace of God. Amen. All of us are only here because of the grace of God. Amen. It's only by him and through him that you and I come to a place where we fall in love with him and then choose to worship him. Well, let's move on. It says in verse 23, as we look at the effects of the obedience, then he will give the rain <clears throat> for your seed with which you sow uh, to the ground, the bread of the increase of the earth. It will be fat and plentiful. In that day, your cattle will be fed in large pastures. Likewise, the oxen and the young donkeys that work with uh, in the ground will eat the cured fodder, and which has been whittled uh, with the shovel of the fan. There will be on every high mountain and on every high hill rivers of, and streams of water. And in the day of the great slaughter, when the towers fall, moreover, the light of the moon will be as light as the, of the sun, and the light of the sun will be sevenfold as the light of the seven days. And in the day that the Lord binds up the bruise of his people and heals the stroke of their wounds. And so what a blessing it is as we look at the millennial reign and, and uh, the Lord using Isaiah to be able to speak about the increase that will come, uh, the abundance that will be there. That's what he is really speaking about. Clearly what will happen when the rebellion stops and the children of Israel turn to Jesus and him being Messiah, the millennial reign, Israel once again living in the blessings of, look what it says, the bread of increase of the earth, and in that day your cattle will be fed in long, large pastures, just showing once again the prosperity that is going to happen when the Lord comes back to reign a thousand years here on the earth. The millennial reign is an incredible story and study to be able to have. Turn to Romans for a moment because I, I want to make sure that we see this. It's interesting to recognize that when Christ comes back and he breaks the yoke of bondage and sin on the earth, that it is not just the people that are going to, to be blessed, but it is all of creation because sin has affected all of creation. Romans chapter 8, the apostle Paul speaks about this time in this way. There is a time coming when the Lord will put all things back into their right place. He says this in chapter 8 and verse 20. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of the corruption into the glorious liberty of of the children of God. There's coming a time when things are going to be right on the earth once again. And the Lord mentions that in Isaiah. The beautiful springs and the water that will be there, the, the lavish gra uh, grasslands that the cattle will feed in and the animals that will be, um, are the animals that will be uh, huge with fat is what he says, or blessed. Uh, in abundance and so there's coming a time when all of creation that has been affected by sin will be put back in its right place Isaiah says in the millennial reign of Christ we will see that happening as it will be freed from the gravity of sin and one more thing before we leave that verse it says this in that day of great slaughter when towers fall and so recognize with me, Isaiah is prophesying about the battle of Armageddon. He's prophesying about the time when the battle and all those nations that come against Israel will be dealt with by the Lord himself. Well, then we get to the judgment of Assyria. Look with me at verse 27. He says, Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar. 
burning with his anger, and his burden is heavy. His lips are full of indignation, his tongue like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream, which reaches up to the neck, to, the, to swift the nations, uh, to sift the nations uh, with its seed and futility. And there shall be a bridle in the jaws of the people, causing them to err. You shall have a song as in the night when the holy festival is kept, and gladness of heart as when one goes with a flute to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel. The Lord will cause his glorious voice to be heard and show the deceit, descent of his arm. With the indignation of his anger and the flame of the devouring fire, <clears throat> with the scattering tempest of hailstones, for through the voice of the Lord, um, Assyria will be beaten down as he strikes it with the rod. And in every place where the staff of punishment passes, which the Lord lays on him, it will be with the tambourines and harps. And in the battle of brandishing, uh, brandishing he will fight with it. For the tulpit was established of old, yes, for the king is prepared. He has made it deep and large, the priors five with much wood, and breath of the Lord is like the stream of brimstone kindles it. And so when the Lord comes, and he comes in anger, it's going to be devastating. The word said he's coming with a burning anger, and we know that when it talks about the Lord coming in a burning anger, I, I picture like a mama protecting her children. As the Lord comes to protect his children, a helpless <laughs> child against the Assyrians, the Lord comes to save. And he brings a lot with him. The word of God says here that he comes and his breath is like an overflowing stream or in a quick and all-consuming way, church, Isaiah is speaking once again of the judgment of the Lord coming, that he comes in that manner. And it's incredible when you think about that because it really is just speaking about Assyria is the one in trouble. It reminds us, doesn't it, of, uh, or it reminds me anyway, of when David went to fight Goliath. And everybody was afraid for David when they should have been afraid for Goliath. And so it is with the Lord when he's speaking about Assyria. Assyria looks like this world power dominating force that's just going to overrun Israel. And yet the Lord says, let me just send one angel to take care of that group. And 185,000 are found dead, corpses all over. Church, it says this, for though the voice of the Lord of Assyria, or through the voice of the Lord, Assyria will be beaten down as he strikes it with the rod. You know, those words just jump out at me, beaten down. I, I don't know if you, you recognize, but certainly men do, don't you, in here, what it means to be beat down. And you understand that the Lord is saying he's coming to beat down the Assyrian army. He's going to wipe it out. He's going to take care of it completely. And then again in 2 Kings we read that, don't we? That the Lord just came in that powerful, miraculous way. And church, this message this morning is one of God being a gracious God and giving warning. He gave warning and warning and warning. And then... Judgment. And I want to say that this morning because I think it's worth repeating. It's warning, warning, warning. But if you continue in rebellion, 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 then there's always consequences. And the Lord makes sure that he's holy. He's pure. He cannot allow for sin to continue without it having consequences. There has to be a penalty for that sin, a payment must be made. 
And that's what the Lord Jesus is all about. We're getting ready to celebrate Christmas and the coming of the Lord. Jesus is the reason for the season. He's the reason for every season. And you and I need to recognize that what the Lord is saying is, look, I'm giving warning, warning, warning. All you have to do is repent. Israel just had to fall on their face before the Lord. Get rid of all the idols. And quit the partying that they were doing rather than sacrificing, rather than worshiping. And the Lord would have continued just to bless Israel. But in their continued rebellion, the Lord had to bring consequences. And so we know those consequences. And they will go into captivity because of their rebellion. Some of us here this morning may have heard the warning of the Lord, the warning of the Lord, the warning of the Lord. Let me tell you that judgment comes if you don't repent. That it's time to be able to ask forgiveness, to beg God to be able to allow for you to pass from that sinful state, that area of your life, or my life, whatever it is that's going on that's not glorifying God. And come to a place where we just bow before him and ask forgiveness. Church, may we hear the warning this morning. Know that he's a gracious God, but he's also a holy God. And he's called us to be holy as he is holy. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. Thank you for who you are. The blessing that we have of being able to see you move in such powerful ways given warning after warning after warning, and then finally, Lord, coming to a place that you, you just bring consequences. We're just asking that you would have your way today in our lives. There's a, a time, Lord, for each of us to be doing a self-inspection, a time when we... God, listen to your word and, and then give way to it. Act on it. Become obedient. And Lord, we're asking that you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, would help us. God, in those areas that we've been warned and we just keep holding on to, would you just empower us to let go, God? Would you rip out the desire for those areas? Take it away. Lord, we want to be those that are holy as you've called us to be. And we know it only comes by your work in us. Lord, you said that you would do the work and that we could rest. May you help us to rest in your holiness. Forgive us, Lord. We ask today that you would forgive us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.